Chapter 15 The door flew open, containing the power of the east wind and the fury of the seventh circle of hell. The skies outside shook with thunder, with the lightning providing a macabre, overdramatic backdrop to what was quickly becoming the largest talking point in the nation. The talking heads, both left and right, weighed in, the right taking the rare stance for the First Amendment, and the ones on the left longing for the first time in their careers for the death penalty. Politicians weighed in, from city council people up to the vice president of the United States. Support had poured in for both sides from such faraway places as Tunisia and Oman. Marches formed outside the campus, black-clad panthers and white-robed clansmen alike bickering for attention and crowing with empty threats of violence from an era thought long dead. All the while, Felix Jones stood and watched, a sly grin on his face. He was writing his place in history, no doubt, and while he would be hated and even loathed, he would have his place nonetheless. He relished the attention in much the same way a serial killer insisted on taunting a terrified public through their letters. It wasn't so much about the cause. While Jones thought minorities to be substandard students, he didn't necessarily hate them. They were simply a pawn in his game. The sad truth of the matter was that, although America had done everything to separate themselves from their hate-filled past, within the dark heart of evil men, hatred still lived, and would continue to breed as long as a culture of fear was allowed to run amok. Such fears were perfect for an extremist like Jones to feed off. Jones made a point to straighten his tie. After all, if he was going to have an enemy, his convoluted views suggested that he do his best to look better than they. It was the same well-dressed theory David Duke had unsuccessfully used back in the 1980s to try and mainstream the Klan. Jones was convinced that it would have worked if Duke had possessed the same deft touch that Jones assumed he possessed. Jones strolled to the overcrowded podium, one rigged with enough microphones to host a presidential debate. Fox News was there. MSNBC was as well. CNN. C-SPAN. Current TV. It was a veritable who's who of political channels. The local news had at first been denied access to the podium, until an intense round of hand-wringing and hell-raising had made for more holes to be drilled and more microphones placed. Local affiliates for CBS, NBC, and two for ABC had rest spots away from half a dozen others. Stuart Avett was the local beat reporter for KCBS 12 in Oakland. A good-looking fellow in his thirties, he had set aside the old-school strong-arm methods of local field reporters and had unabashedly played on his warm face and liberal leanings to grant himself access in places where most reporters could not. Higher placement was a dream, just as it was with any reporter but in his thirties, and in one place for six years at one station, Stuart knew that time was running short. He needed a break. And by playing both sides, he would find one in what would become known as the Felix Jones standoff. Jones had decided to play tribute to Governor Wallace. The Board of Trustees had yet to penetrate his contract, and by commitment and under fear of suit, he was still gainfully employed by the university system of the state of California. Lawsuits were pending. In the meantime, a friendly conservative judge from Orange County had granted an injunction to keep Jones from being terminated. Most of the state screamed, those in Orange County hid in shame and distanced themselves from the judge. The judge himself was 83, a longtime donor to conservative causes and on the brink of retirement. He didn't give a damn how the gossip ran. In fact, it was nice to see his name in print one more time before he was put out to pasture. <laughs> 